Have you ever wondered how insects got so large during the Carboniferous period in Earth's history? Well, in today's video, I'm going to be talking about the Ice Age that was happening in this period that wasn't directly correlated to the giant insects, but was indirectly correlated, and we'll talk about why they got so big as well later in the video. First things first, I just want to mention the timeline of this ice age occurred in the Pennsylvanian period or the later half of the Carboniferous period in the Paleozoic era. This second half of the Carboniferous or Pennsylvanian period occurred from around 318 to 299 million years ago. The ice age continued into the early Permian, which is a period that occurred from around 299 to 251 million years ago. And this ice age persisted for around 50 million years before the middle and late Permian period brought global warming, which is something we'll talk about a little bit at the end of this video, but mostly in the Great Dying or Permian Extinction video, which if it's not out on my channel yet, it will be out very soon. To set the scene a little bit, the early Carboniferous or the Mississippian half of the Carboniferous, Mississippian, and Pennsylvanian periods was actually quite warm and moist. But during the mid Carboniferous, around the boundary between Mississippian and Pennsylvanian, Gondwana land, which was the southern supercontinent on Earth at the time, collided with a northern mass of supercontinent, Euramerica, and Pangaea began to form. But this was not only the beginning of Pangaea, the famous Permian supercontinent, but also the greatest ice age since Snowball Earth, aka the greatest ice age in the Phanerozoic, which includes the Paleozoic, Mesozoic, and Cenozoic eras. Due to this ice age, sea level dropped as it does when ice grows. The water taken up into the ice is no longer in the ocean, so the ocean level drops. And because of sea level drop, shallow seas that had transgressed onto continental masses were regressing. In other words, their basin margins were shifting seaward because there wasn't enough water to have them so far inland. This caused a major global disconformity or an erosional surface in the rock record that represents period of non-deposition that actually in part because of its global extent led scientists to split the Carboniferous period into the Mississippian and the Pennsylvania where the Pennsylvanian included the Ice Age time period. In this ice age, high latitudes became much colder and more seasonal. And because equators didn't cool as much as the poles, this steepened the temperature gradient from equator to poles. And that steepened temperature gradient can greatly affect ocean circulation because a steeper temperature gradient means stronger winds and stronger winds mean more upwelling, aka a mode of ocean mixing and circulation at ocean margins. But what set off the Ice Age? What caused the cooling to begin in the first place? Well, we know that the Carboniferous is named for the abundance of carbon or coal deposits that were accumulated during that period. These coal deposits formed from plant debris that accumulated in swampy areas that were just everywhere during the Carboniferous. And this incredible sink for carbon or increase in carbon burial caused atmospheric carbon dioxide to become reduced enough to reduce the greenhouse gas effect at the time, leading to cooling, the opposite of what's occurring today with increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. In addition to a reduced greenhouse effect, forests spread in the late Devonian just before the Carboniferous period, which intensified continental weathering. Now, I talk in a few of my videos about how continental weathering increases carbon burial. In short, the weathering of continental rocks leads to the eventual deposition of carbonate rocks, which contain carbon, and that deposition represents a long-term carbon sink in which carbon is buried for millions of years until volcanism or or some other mode of transport allows it to be released again into the atmosphere. So this just represents a long-term carbon sink. And that also eventually over millions of years on geologic timescales reduces atmospheric carbon dioxide. And because this was happening in the late Devonian, it likely did have enough time to make a difference in terms of reducing atmospheric carbon dioxide on that time scale in time for the ice age to begin during the Pennsylvanian. And much like the modern ice age, there were cycles, just like we have the interglacial cycles today and have had that for the past few millions of years, glaciers also expanded and contracted during the Pennsylvanian ice age. Like I mentioned earlier, when ice grows, sea level falls, and when the ice contracts or the glaciers retreat, they melt and the sea level rises again. And we contract this 
rise and fall of sea level through transgression and regression sequences. In other words, we can tell in the rock record where and to what extent the sea level rose and fall and at what time periods and how often and how long the oscillations lasted. And the other more obvious piece of evidence for the ice age during this Pennsylvanian period is glacial tillites, striations, and lusts. Glacial tillites deposited as moraines, marking the extent of glaciers before they retreat, melt, and dump all their sediment where they last were extended to, or lateral moraines along the sides of glaciers. Any tillite deposits or moraine deposits are very indicative of glacial extent and where they traveled, how far they extended before they retreated, etc. Striations and like smooth surfaces where only glaciers could have smoothed that surface or striated that surface the way that it did or scour marks those also give us an idea of where glaciers have been in the past and less which is a silt sized dust that can only be grinded so fine and deposited in such accumulated amounts from the grinding of glaciers against rocks that creates the dust and then it runs down and fluvial deposits from meltwater off the end of the glacier and then is deposited in some way or dries up and is flown into to Aeolian dunes, whatever, but the lus itself is created by glacial grinding. And during this time and in the locations where glaciers would have been, there are plenty of tillite deposits, striations, and lus deposits. But what I find the most interesting about studying this ice age are the effects that it had on biology. Unfortunately, due to the ice age, there was mass extinction. It's not one of the big five mass extinctions that we recognize throughout Earth's history, but it was a mass extinction nevertheless. And it was directly due to the cooling and glaciation that occurred during the time because any abrupt change, cooling, warming, whatever it might be, does tend to cause life that can't adapt to go extinct. This mass extinction hit mostly marine life, and keep in mind that during the Carboniferous, life was only just starting to get its footing on land anyway, so there wasn't much land life yet to devastate, but in the ocean, life was well established and, you know, we had our trilobites roaming around abundant and all. We had ammonoids and nautiloids swimming around, there were corals and sponges and crinoids, all of these were pretty dominant in the Paleozoic seas. And after the extinctions, recovery was really slow because the Ice Age lasted for another nearly 50 million years and the extinctions occurred right at the beginning. So recovery was really hard for those species that went extinct because of the cooling, because the cooling wasn't over. But because of the extinction of the species that couldn't adapt to the cold environments, cold adapted flora spread over the southern hemisphere or Gondwana land, which had just collided into Pangaea, so kind of the southern part of Pangaea at the time. And this survival of cold adapted species actually might have made the global warming in the Permian period that contributed to the greatest extinction of all time called the Great Dying even more devastating, which is really sad to think about because you were cold adapted so you survived the first extinction, but then warming happened and then you couldn't survive the second one. I mean, that's just, that's just rude. But the other cool effect of this ice age, like I mentioned at the beginning of the video, was that the increase in carbon burial allowed oxygen to increase in the atmosphere to insane levels, never seen before levels of around 35% as opposed to its today levels that are 21%. And because oxygen concentration governs body size in arthropods, giant insects resulted from this 35% oxygen level. Just a couple examples, there were giant dragonflies with over two foot wingspans and giant millipedes that were 10 feet long. And these millipedes were actually the largest land bug to have ever lived on earth. And I do want to specify here, just so I don't hear about it in the comments, I know millipedes are not insects, but giant or gigantic arthropods is just not as good a thumbnail phrase, so I said insects, okay? And lastly, what ended the Ice Age? How did it come to an end, and you know, how was there warming after this cool period? Well, early in the Permian, there was an increase in aridity. There was drying, which decreased continental weathering rates because rain needs to happen more often to increase the continental weathering rates, and with less 
less rain due to less evaporation, due to drying, there's less continental weathering, so carbon dioxide can build up the atmosphere more, and coal swamps dried up, and therefore carbon barrier rates slowed once again, also increasing the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. This initial carbon dioxide increase in the atmosphere would have started global warming to the point that ice would have started melting. And when ice starts to melt, that's a positive feedback because ice has a really good surface reflectivity or what's called albedo, aka it reflects solar radiation or sunlight to the point that it cools Earth even more. And when it's melting, it's exposing all this really absorbent land that takes up a lot of sunlight and heats up Earth more. So global warming would have caused, ironically, more global warming. And the other positive feedback associated with the warming would have been the melting of methane hydrates, releasing methane into the atmosphere, furthering the greenhouse gas effect, also increasing warming. So this warming caused more warming. And then we have a huge spike during the Permian, both at the end of the middle Permian and then at the end of the end Permian. And that was a really, really huge extinction, the biggest of all time, like I mentioned earlier. And I talk about that in a separate video called The Great Dying. And I didn't come up with that name. Wish I had, pretty cool name, but that's what people call it. Anyway, complementary to the increase in carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, oxygen also decreased, which ended the reign of gigantic insects during this time. The reason for the inverse relationship between carbon and oxygen comes back to respiration and photosynthesis. Photosynthesis takes up carbon, releases oxygen. Respiration takes up oxygen, releases carbon dioxide. When carbon barrier rates are slow, more oxygen is used up to break down the organic carbon and oxidize it into carbon dioxide, which is then released. And the oxygen is used up in that process. And therefore that's a sink for oxygen and a source for carbon. On the flip side, when carbon burial rates are high, carbon is being sinked, sunk, and it's being buried and taken out of the atmosphere. And therefore, the oxygen that would have been used to oxidize that carbon is not being used and instead is kind of being sourced to the atmosphere, even though it's not really being released to the atmosphere by anything, it's just not being taken up from it. So the lack of sink of oxygen during the time of high burial rates of carbon is why the oxygen and the carbon have an inverse relationship. So when one decreases in the atmosphere, the other increases. There are sometimes complexities within this relationship that can change that, but that's the general trend. In any case, we're very sad that the giant insects are no longer with us because that would have been awesome, but also a little terrifying. So maybe we're a little bit happy too. Anyway, guys, I'm just rambling on now. So I'm going to say thank you so much for watching. If you want to check out the major reference I'm using to make this and other videos in this playlist, I'm using Earth System History. It's linked in my description below if you want to check it out. Also, if you want to check out the related videos to this one, like the Great Dying video I had mentioned a couple times and the Late Paleozoic Life video, which is just a Video where I talk about all the life that was present in the late Paleozoic. You can check those out. I'll try and put them on a screen here if they're out of my channel right now. If they're not out yet, I'll try and get them out very soon. And if you want to check out a video about any other type of event that's happened in Earth's history, you can click on my historical geology playlist, which if it isn't up here yet, it should pop up any second now. And that playlist has like all historical geology in it. Anyway, thank you guys again for watching and I will see you in the next video. Bye.